Perth's China Dolls, how four little girls who were strangers became sisters. Burnout battles, a state's sizzling new motorsport. Plus, the world's hottest chilli hits WA. Hi, I'm Blake Johnson from 7 News. And I'm Cassie Silver from Today Tonight. Welcome to our celebration of life in WA. We trained as broadcasters at Edith Cowan University, so we're proud to present these outstanding stories by current third year students. First, the little Perth girls who live like sisters, sharing four sets of parents. It's a family like no other, brought together by extraordinary acts of love. Emily McCarthy has the story. Hi, I'm Grace and I'm 10 years old and I was born in Beijing, in China. Hello, my name is Yasmina and I'm nine, nine years old and I was born, I think, in Wuwei in China. Hello, I'm Charlotte and I was born in the city of Yangdong. My name is Ava and I was born in Guangdong. Every child in the world deserves a chance. A chance to be loved, cared for and protected. A chance to be carefree and live with curiosity, excitement and innocence. This is exactly what four Perth families gave to these little girls. Between the four families, the, the journey started about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, all of us decided we wanted to bring a child home um, from China, home to Perth to be in our families. Left at various orphanages around China, Grace, Yasmina, Charlotte and Ava have been kept together from the start, meaning they have a continuous support system that is different to other friendships they may have. When I play with Grace, Ava and Charlotte, it feels like they understand how we, each other feels about everyone. But school is just, there's so many people there and they start, there's so many friendships but I think the closest is probably with my Chinese friends. From a young age, these girls have truly been aware of how different their lives would have been if it wasn't for the adoption, a confronting yet honest reality that isn't what any child deserves. Here it's so safe and warm, but over there I would have been left on the streets and I wouldn't have any family to hug or if I was sad. I would be lost and I would have not had anything. Growing up in Perth has given these girls a lifetime of opportunity, off polluted streets and away from poverty. What a great place to bring up our kids. I mean, 365 days of the year, almost we've got sunshine, great education, great amenities, great parks, no pollution, opportunities galore. It can't be easy going through the trials and tribulations that these families have faced in their lives, but it is clear to see that having the kids brought up together, healthy and happy in Perth has been a great blessing. Rotness adorable quokkas are world famous, a WA icon. But the shocking truth is if we're not careful, we'll lose them forever. Alicia McFarlane explains. They are the world's friendliest animal, but are vulnerable to extinction. Whilst quokkas are bringing a global audience to Rottnest Island, perhaps it's their friendliness that is putting them in danger. Trish Fleming is a passionate quokka researcher and urges that change must occur. Animals that are less predator wary and don't move away when people approach are more likely to be struck by vehicles, for example, or bicycles on the island. Even touching and feeding the species can have severe effects. But don't think this is the peak of Rottnest popularity because plans are already in place to further develop the island. Hotel Rottnest has already received approval for an expansion, allowing them to develop nearly nine acres of vacant land, land that quokkas call home. Rottnest has received a significant increase to tourism, with last year having a 17% rise alone. This is the main cause to destruction to quokkas and their habitat. The expansion to the Rottnest Hotel will no doubt attract more tourists, meaning a higher risk for quokkas. Both Hotel Rottnest and the Rottnest Island Authority have given no comment on the issue. The majority of tourists, even people living in Western Australia, think that Rottnest is the only home of quokkas. However, there are in fact colonies on the mainland. As there is a high threat to the species on Rottnest, these colonies are critical to their long-term survival but they are facing their own battle of logging. 
Julianne Hilbers is a spokeswoman for Quokka Rescue, which raises money to stop the logging of habitat for quokkas near Bunbury. Tasmania was a great example where you saw a disease come into a population with the Tassie devils that threatened that whole kind of group and you need these other populations to remain strong so that you can, as a collective, if something happens to the ones on Rottnest, that we can, they can um, reproduce. Next, Burnout Battles, WA's sizzling new motorsport. To our youngest inspiration this WA day, little Sinead Engelbreck, who was given a 1% chance of surviving a rare brain tumour. Miraculously, she's beaten the odds and created a clever way of helping others. Evie Morgan explains. Six years ago, um, we had four beautiful boys and we were blessed with a beautiful baby girl. And then she was 10, 11 weeks old and she was diagnosed with a morbid grade 4 stage 4 glioblastoma brain tumour and um, that's when our nightmare began, a parent's worst nightmare. At 11 weeks old, Sinead Engelbrecht was given a 1% chance of survival. It was, you know, it was something that you wouldn't even dream or even imagine that, that you would ever be told. Um, it was absolutely heartbreaking. Doctors told her parents, David and Haley, that only a miracle could save her, but if Sinead did survive, she would be severely brain damaged. And at that point, we were even told that chemotherapy would be inhumane and, um, and that it would only be buying us time and not actually a cure. But um, they got it wrong and uh, we proved them wrong. And she's a, a fighter and definitely a little miracle. So she's a bubbly, bouncy six and a half year old who's doing all the normal things that any six and a half year old would be doing. Sinead's miracle has inspired her family to help others and they're doing just that with this transformed school bus. After noticing a lack of awareness for blood donations and childhood cancer, alongside friends, Sinead's father, David, organised a charity fundraising group called the Inspired Crusaders. Let's get out there and go and do something about it, you know, and, and that's what it is. And... That's, that's what I'm doing and I'm trying my best to, to do it wherever we can. When the charity was given an old rundown school bus, David took the opportunity to turn it into a charity fundraising party bus. Instead of having a go to Masters or Bunnings and having a sausage sizzle or something, the bus is actually a better kind of way to, to get that funds coming in for the charities. So far, the Do Good Bus has raised up to $100,000 for Perth charities. Whatever people want to use the bus for, it's it's there to go. The drivers doesn't get any kind of uh, right out of this. No one, no one gets a single cent out of this bus for personal gain. It is completely 100% for charities. It's just a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. WA police have banned burnouts in their crackdown on hoon driving. But as Nick Marta reports, what is illegal on our streets has turned into a sensational motorsport. <laughs> Yeah, it's a drug and I'm addicted to it. Burnouts is one of the biggest, baddest and most outrageous motorsports in the world and it's thriving right here in our backyard. Thousands of horsepower hitting the ground to do only one thing, turn tyres into smoke. And it all centres around this place, WA's very own Perth Motorplex. This pad of essentially rubberized concrete may not seem like much, but it sure means a heck of a lot. Thousands of people pack the stands here at the Perth Motorplex to watch their favorite drivers tear up the aptly named snake pit for $10,000 cash. When you first come in and look at it, a burnout comp at the Perth Motorplex, you think, this is crazy, these guys are nuts. Why would they destroy a perfectly good car, they think? But there's a bit more to it than just cash. As the Motorplex's Dean Neal explains. It takes a lot of skill, first of all, to drive the car well on the pad to win the event. And secondly, the mechanicals of the car. A lot of the cars in burnout competitions here at the Plex, they're basically street machine or hot rod magazine cars. They're beautiful cars, state-of-the-art build. But mechanically, they need to make sure the engines and everything around them maintain the rage for two minutes or more because that's a key criteria in trying to win the event. It's a big adrenaline rush for you. There's 
over thousands, thousands of people down there. When it comes to competitors, Matt Hughes and his 587 horsepower green monster are a sure standout. The FIFO working father of four also stands out in a different way. He stands out because even though burnouts are all about controlled chaos, as YouTuber Flinty460 shows, Monster manages to do just the opposite. This car keeps Matt on the straight and narrow. We've got mates that are taking the other path where they're actually doing drugs, and I chose the other path of buying, you know, a little ute and spending all my hard-earned money on that and having fun and enjoying it and getting other people to get enjoyment out of it as well. Coming up, canine carers, the clever dogs looking after Perth children. In a WA first, the Telethon Kids Institute is using cleverly trained dogs to help children with autism and special needs. As Christina Simic explains, these canine carers are changing lives. You're not going to have intervention 24 hours a day. You've got these dogs in your house 24 hours a day. They're there when your children go to sleep. They're there when your children wake up. Like many children with autism, six-year-old Christian struggles to connect and communicate. But unlike most kids with the condition, Christian has a best buddy, Rufus. WA's one of four autism assistance dogs. So when Christian gets that pulling sensation, then he knows, oh, yep, we're going this way. Yep, Rufus has got me in check. Before Rufus, Christian's behaviour was unpredictable, making regular tasks such as shopping and routine haircuts impossible. I could never do that, ever, by holding his hand. Autism is where the brain develops differently and diagnosis is based on behaviours such as repetitive and restrictive ones, communication difficulties and social impairment. And it's the social impairment behaviour that links a dog like Rufus to a boy like Christian. Professor Andrew Whitehouse from the Telethon Kids Institute says research about assistance dogs has begun at the Institute. All of a sudden, mums and dads have been imploring us to look at this and the tippy toes of science that we've started conducting seems to look like it might be positive. Like Amanda, who recently applied for an autism assistance dog for her five-year-old son Charlie, who has also been diagnosed with the potential of seizure activity. One of the number one reasons we want an, aut an autism assistance dog for Charlie is for some safety. Assistance dogs train for up to two years, with an initial cost of $20,000 to $27,000. Covering basic puppy lessons, learn visual and voice cues for emotional physical support, blocking sources of stress and anxiety, and remaining calm during loud noises. Ready to guide and never leave his buddy's side. Research has shown more than 1% of Australians have an autism spectrum disorder, which has increased 50-fold over the last 25 to 30 years. And on top of all the conventional treatments and therapies, research is beginning to show positive results for the use of autism assistance dogs, like the undeniable bond between Rufus and Christian. People with autism and their families have so much to give the world. If assistance dogs is one medium through which that can come out, God, let's, let's pursue it with all vigour. Everyone loves a good laugh and science shows it really is the best medicine for making us happy. To tap into this natural high, Perth people are now taking laughing lessons. Taylor Hanna joins the fun. Welcome to Laughter Yoga Classes, the ultimate well-being workout. First developed in Mumbai, India in 1955 by qualified medical doctor Martin Kataria and his yoga teacher wife, they discovered that laughter has significant health benefits. With approximately 6,000 laughter clubs in 70 countries around the world, laughter yoga is made up of various exercises forcing laughter, which turns into real laughter as you relax. Laughter Yoga is a body-to-mind connection where we use actions and activities to really focus on getting a positive mindset from our body to our minds. The session is in three simple parts. A clapping mantra produces endorphins into the bloodstream through acupressure points in your hands and is repeated throughout the class. Extended breathing is used to bring the class into a present moment feeling. 
A range of high energy and fun exercises makes the group active and happy. Peter Sharp, director of Kaizen Wellbeing, became involved in laughter yoga in 2012 and has not looked back since. Yeah, if this works for me as a better way to de-stress and find a lighter side to life, then I knew that there'd be other people that could benefit from it as well. Suzanne Keating, registered psychologist, believes that laughter yoga is a great way to improve general well-being. It helps um, boost the immune system, it gives you more energy, it's really good for the heart, um, relaxes the body muscle-wise. We know that reduces stress. <laughs> <laughs> laughter yoga as a worldwide community movement is free and accessible to all. There are currently seven laughter clubs in the metropolitan area. Details for these classes can be found at laughwa.org.au. Next on Made in WA, the world's hottest chilli put to the test. Spinning at 50 kilometres an hour around the sloping sides of a bicycle speed dome, it's not for the faint-hearted. But a group of Perth kids is risking it all, dreaming of becoming cycling superstars. Talara Casey has more. It's fast, furious, and in this velodrome could be the first Indigenous cycling star. The Indigenous Talent Identification and Development Squad started this like year. Man. Development coach Amanda O'Connor hopes to create the first Indigenous Olympic track cyclist. Ultimately, the aim of the program is to have the first Indigenous rider pulling on that green and gold jersey for Australia and standing up there on that podium, you know, and representing their country. Lamana and Rory were drawn to the sport two years ago. I find that it's involving everyone and it makes it a lot more fun when everyone's joining in and having fun like you are. They learn everything they need to know about the discipline of cycling and on top of that we have workshops. So those workshops could uh, cover something like basic bike mechanics, they could cover goal setting, they could cover nutrition. These kids are as young as eight years old and getting up to 50 kilometres per hour. That's faster than you drive in a school zone. The program is the first of its kind in Australia, and it's right here in WA. From Australia, you got Kaylin Young, the current ABA number one pro. Kaylin, an Indigenous BMX rider and former Olympian, says the ITID squad will need trust and honesty as fundamental building blocks in a new program like this. It's pretty special, but just that the fact that there is a program dedicated to Indigenous athletes and they want to have an athlete, an Indigenous athlete, in a village program. It'd be pretty cool to be part of. They might dust off their shoes and look great at themselves. But at the moment, it looks like 10-year-old Lamana Valentine is up for the challenge. I'm going to be the first Indigenous person to go to the Olympics for cycling. The world's hottest chilli has hit WA, but just how fiery is it? Cam Ingalls finds someone brave enough to ignore the warnings and put it to the test. West Australia is known for being hot, but it's not just the weather that's making people sweat. Chilli is on the increase in WA with more and more chilli products hitting the market. But is it becoming too hot to handle? WA is now home to the world's hottest chilli, the Carolina Reaper. Chilli heads all over the world are taking the challenge of eating one whole. Needless to say, it doesn't always pan out well. These London YouTubers take on the challenge. Taken straight to the hospital. So yeah, um, for those thinking of trying the Carolina Reaper, I would say don't. Just simply don't, especially when you find out later you're allergic to pepper. So just how hot is the Carolina Reaper? Ray Coley from the Chili Factory gives us an insight. On the Scoville scale is rated about two and a half million and Carolina Reaper is currently the hottest fresh chili in the world. To put that in perspective, on the Scoville scale, a jalapeno is a maximum of 5,000 Scoville units. This little fella is 550 times hotter. That's hotter than some police pepper sprays. But are people in WA brave enough to try the challenge? So I'm here with Nev. Nev, you were challenged to eat one Carolina Reaper and what have you done? I decided to stupidly eat two. They're ugly little things and I thought, well, I'm going to pop the whole thing in my mouth because it didn't look that big and I chewed through it quite quickly, the texture was fine and then all of a sudden it started to get in the back of your throat. Thinking I was on top of it, I wasn't. 
Luckily for Nev and brave YouTubers around the world, the creator of the Carolina Reaper has actually created an even hotter chili. Jerry Carter from Wildfire Chili says this chili has reached a new benchmark. So the new chili, the Gator from Ed Curry, is believed to be 3 million Scovilles at peak temperature. But why are chili products getting so popular in WA? Grant Nixon from the Araluan Botanic Park believes travelling is playing a strong role. Well, I think it's, it's mainly that we're so close to Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam, so our young people these days are, are going up there for our holidays rather than going east or maybe in the old days going over to the UK. So um, they're coming back with this taste of, the, of, the, um, of Asia. But as for the Carolina Reaper challenge, WA growers warn people should be wary. We tell them how hot it is, so we let them know, and if they want a spoonful and they collapse, then I'm sorry, but we did warn you. <laughs> Well, that's made in WA thanks to the broadcasting students at ECU. Enjoy the rest of your WA day on 7.